I'm Chuck DeVita. Uh, our firm, Growth Process Group, helps early to mid-stage technology companies get investment, acquire customers, and grow revenues and profits. All right? We are not a sales training company, but I don't, I'm, I'm not offended, Marcelo. I understand. And um, LinkedIn is? So, uh, yeah, so I'm Alan Blue. Uh, LinkedIn, probably have heard of LinkedIn. Um, I founded about three and a half years ago or four years ago. LinkedIn is an online professional tool based on people's professional networks. I, most people have probably heard of it or run across it one way or another. Um, so, yeah, we're about three and a half years old. We do a lot of different things. We do uh, personal professional services, and we do uh, recruiting, and we do sales, sales support, lead generation, uh, and we serve almost 9 million people uh, in the world. Great. So uh, my background includes uh, started life as an engineer here in the Valley. Uh, later, after working as a product marketing engineer in technology companies, I came to the business school and got an MBA. Uh, this uh, June will be my 37th anniversary. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, I've done two startups and sort of migrated from larger companies down to smaller uh, those startups made it into the mid-20 millions of dollars kind of range in the old days when you started from scratch, kind of like the current days, I guess, mm -hmm. and then got some customers and then got investment. And I've done a, a public turnaround. Our firm, Growth Process Group, has been around for 11 years, helping technology companies originally only in the enterprise software space. We've now expanded that into uh, several fields, including appliances, uh, instrumentation, and interestingly enough, we have a partner now in the clean energy space, and we are holding a number of events in energy technology, and we've had some successful uh, assignments with energy technology companies, and that's going to be a very exciting area. So um, I have been talking about acquiring first customers and reference customers for some time. I teach in the continuing studies uh, program. I teach three classes a year. In May, on a Saturday, May 5th, I'll teach a class on sales management excellence, all right, a one-day workshop. Uh, and, of course, it used to be just about enterprise because that's what was of interest. And as uh, we've evolved now, uh, if you look at where the VCs are investing money, you know, they sort of say, well, enterprise is dead. I don't believe that. Uh, but also there's tremendous interest in the consumer. And so it's back to eyeballs, but we don't call it eyeballs, right, because that was a bad thing. So now it's about an advertising model. And so as I was uh, crafting this material last fall for a presentation that we did to a group of entrepreneurs from uh, Moscow, uh, Alan joined as a panelist. And then he and I worked together to incorporate uh, consumer content because getting to consumers is really important, and I can't spell retail. So that's why uh, we're sharing the presentation. Uh, I would encourage you to ask questions throughout as opposed to holding them to the end. Uh, in the interest of time, I may have to cut them short, but let's make this be interactive. Let's make it have value for you. Uh, so some key questions you might think about is what problem are you solving for customers? Notice the word technology is not there, right? That probably isn't unusual for business school people, but it might be for technical entrepreneurs. What is your value proposition? In other words, how do you translate what you do into economic or pleasure value, as you'll hear from Alan? Uh, what do you want from your early customers? Be very, very clear about what you're looking for from your first customers, okay? And oftentimes, I'm going to suggest it, it's not revenue. That doesn't mean you don't want to get money from them. It's just that that's not the most important thing. What type of product do you have or service? Is it enterprise or consumer? And then how are you going to distribute? You know, what are the sales, marketing, and support kinds of issues? And how about channels, right? Should you use channels early or later? Can you achieve referenceability through channels or not? Those are some of the key questions. So in terms of technology, you have, if we're going to enterprises, sort of the old, if you will, traditional, sometimes called heavyweight model, uh, where we install software behind the firewall, and the customer has a substantial support and maintenance burden over the course of the life of use of that software. Uh, there's an appliance model, which is much more like a plug and play, where you wheel it in, you plug it in, and it works in their environment with far less support. And then, of course, the exciting one is software as a service, right? 
And, and so the suggestion I'm going to make to you is think about the problem you're solving for your customer and think about these as alternatives for delivering that solution to the customer. The way you do it does not necessarily define your business model, your revenue model, or your pricing model. We have done projects where we've done enterprise license-like pricing for SaaS models and the reverse, where it makes sense. Okay, on the consumer side, the question is, are you a Web 1.0 technology company or a Web 2.0 technology? And we have an expert in Alan to talk about that. So I'm going to spend some time on the enterprise now. And these are uh, some comparisons of various attributes of selling to enterprises. We have an on-premise license behind the firewall, an on-premise appliance, and then software sold as a service. So the sales expertise and post-sales support moves from higher to lower. And you'll hear the venture capitalists talking about it doesn't cost anything to sell in a SaaS model. Not true, but it is a lot lower than a direct sales heavy-duty license model. Uh, installation and customization, typically an enterprise license might be high, and in a perfect SaaS model would be zero, right? Plug-and-play installation likewise moves from the, the not available for premise license down to absolutely for SaaS. Uh, there are significant data security issues, there are IT support issues, and uh, total cost of ownership, that's TCO. Uh, and, and so in the on-premise license, you have to include the infrastructure you have to buy. You have to include the IT people you have to use to support it, right? All that stuff is a total cost of ownership. So when you're looking at your value propositions, I, by the way, I teach a class in the fall on developing value propositions and pricing models. You must use a total cost of ownership basis when you're developing value propositions for the customer. It's not just what you charge your customer. And then cost of goods sold, COGS, right, moves from n you have no COGS in an on-premise license to very significant for ISP uh, services uh, in a SaaS model. And then, of course, the other issue is the source tree. You might well have multiple source trees in an enterprise license model. In an ideal SaaS model, you would only have one. And that's a significant cost saver if you can do that. That's one of the reasons investors are attracted to that model. So, key questions again in the enterprise. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. The question is, do I have handouts of these? No, but I am going to email a copy of the presentation, given your permission. I forgot to ask you, but I assume that's okay. Uh, to um, to uh, It's here. Anyway, Marcelo, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, he will make that available. Uh, so, are you prepared to go to market, really, right? Is your initial goal revenue or referenceability? How many of you think it should be revenue? Come on, some of you think it should be revenue as your initial goal, right? And I'm going to suggest to you that if you don't get your references squared away properly, you'll plateau out at some point that will be unsatisfactory. Be clear on what you want from your early customers. Um, why will they buy? How much will they pay? Uh, how should the sales process evolve? Uh, do you know who to sell to? We have a process we call a map of value to pain. We map our value proposition to the pain of title types. Different title types care about different things. So get clear on who should be buying your product or might have acute pain. Oftentimes, early stage companies think their challenge is to convince customers that they need some. All right? Wrong challenge, in my view. You know what? Mine. mine Everybody, thank you. I, um, let me do this. So, uh, when you go through that process, sometimes a ha has come out in people or title types you didn't identify you should be addressing, and perhaps some you're trying to address that might be a waste of time. Differentiate between your sponsor that brings you in and who makes the decision to buy. And also take a look at things like what should your pipeline be like, all right? What's the ratio of leads to sales? And then how about channels? And by the way, direct selling is a channel. Telephone selling is a channel. Web selling is a channel. All right, so this is a progression of a company. The blue line is meant to approximate cash flow. You move from a vision stage to a strategy stage. You then explore some opportunities to apply your solution to different markets and different problems. And sorry, and then you go into execution mode once you've found the sweet spot. Right? How many of you are trying to do something for both consumers and enterprise as startup companies? Nobody? Somebody. Okay. Uh, you won't, likely you won't succeed 
And so you're going to have some tough choices to make. Reasons being company culture. In a consumer model, it's an out-of-the-box kind of thing, right, with minimal support. In an enterprise model, heavy, heavy support, the customer expects that. So trying to do both in terms of the kinds of people you hire, the experiences they have, the structures you set up, make it very difficult for an early-stage company to do both. So I would offer that as an opportunity for you. Um, so now, initially your product, right, has a particular value proposition and a particular pricing model, right? Don't design a perfect product first. Rather, do a prototype. Get it out there to get feedback from your initial customers. Evolve it into the next generation and so on. So one of the things you might ask was, uh, who should sell what at which stage as we're going through this? Initially, it's the founding team trying to get one customer to understand basic need, all right? And then we call that the discovery phase. Then uh, it's the executive team. If there's a sales executive, fine. We offer interim services as sales executives for companies, um, where it's a combination of technology and services, and you're learning about the feature set that your customers will want, and the objective is four to six significant customers. So that's the learning phase. Then you go into the execution phase with a professional sales team, standardized products and solutions, and it's very, very transaction-oriented, and we're trying to get tens and hundreds of customers. Now, uh, do you know where you are on this particular uh, schema? Can you identify the place of your company? You should be able to do that. And, and uh, one of the things we often see is companies will hire the outstanding star from the large company in the related space who's a transaction expert in one of these phases. All right? And these people are not learners. They're out there to do deals. They expect products to be mature. They expect demos to be done. They expect solutions to be great, right? which is not the case when you're going to early stage customers. So be cautious of that and think about the, uh, the talent and the experiences you need at the stage that you are in. And when we see companies hire this, people that do this well in these two stages, it's usually six to nine months they quit or get fired. That costs the company, that costs the individual, right? So you don't want to go through that. Okay, so these are any two dimensions that you care about, your ability to rewrite the code tomorrow and your ability to support it in Afghanistan for free for the next five years or anything else that matters, okay? The X is a customer requirement. The circle defines your set of resources at that point in time to serve those requirements, all right? And how many of you experience this? Next customer opportunity comes along and it's somewhere else? Yeah, that's fairly common for early stage companies, right? And what we want, and, and the question is, should you go there or not? Because by definition, you can't do both, right? You can't serve both at, at a point in time. And what you want to find is a market like this where there's enough opportunities to uh, achieve a beachhead. Anybody who hasn't read Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm? Been around for about 20 years, right? A very important book. I share with you another book that's really good, written by Steve Blank, uh, who has done some seminars with me, who's a very successful entrepreneur, founder of Epiphany. It's called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. He teaches at the Haas School in Berkeley, and uh, he, a lot of what I'm talking to you about, Steve talks about very eloquently in that book from a product marketing perspective. So the entrepreneur's dream uh, about going to market is, I have an idea, I'm going to design a product, I'm going to set some goals, I'm going to hire a sales team, and we're going to go sell it. Isn't that kind of how we look at it? Right? Very straightforward, very serial. Right? Well, I'd like to share with you what I think reality is in getting enterprise customers at an early stage. Of course, you have the high-level strategic stuff, the vision, the mission, and the goals. You select some target markets that you'd like to go to. You propose, at this point, what we call value hallucination, because it's not validated in the marketplace, right? But it's an important exercise to go through. You propose what your ideal customer looks like, and you select some target titles to go to with this proposed solution. Now then... You look for ownership, budget, and acute pain about the problem you're solving. You don't spend cycles trying to convince people they need some. You go to a prospect and you say, you have acute pain? No, thank you very much. You have acute pain? No, thank you very much. You have acute pain, budget, and ownership about the problem? Yes, I'm going to spend time selling to you. I'm going to work with you because that's efficient, all right? And so think of a filtering mechanism to understand these things as opposed to a teaching mechanism. Small companies do not have the resources to educate the market. 
Make sense? Right? And yet, we see companies trying to do that all the time. Now then, having identified those target titles and those target markets, you iterate the process by going out in the field and talking to executives about what they care for. And how you measure acute pain is they must have or are willing to create budget in the current year for your solution as item one, two, or three on their budget. That's acute pain. Anything else isn't. Right? And so the measurement is easy. The information is hard to get. All right, Companies prevent us from getting to budget owners. We call them economic buyers, people who make decisions who can make the decision to buy your solution. Now then, having then tested the markets, you're moving from assumptions to facts. Be very critical of yourselves about your assumptions versus facts. Facts come from customers, right? Facts come from the field. Assumptions come from within your organization. Oftentimes, we go through exercises with clients and we test for assumptions versus facts. And initially, the answers are, oh, we have facts about all these problems we solve. And then we start drilling and a large number of them tend to be assumptions, which is good. If you know you don't have facts, you can identify that fact and go out and get some. Right? You can configure projects to talk to customers and get facts. And that's really, really important. Now then, having selected a market, because most early stage companies cannot serve more than one market, right? you choose one and you focus on it, and now you go acquire your development partner customers or your reference customers. You refine your product. You develop your sales tools. You refine your value propositions. And you develop your sales process. And then you hire a sales team, and now you go execute and sell repeatedly. Make sense? All right? I find a lot of early stage entrepreneurs do not have the patience for this, for the testing and learning phase. All right? They think that their baby is so beautiful, everybody should want one, and all I have to do is see it and they'll buy it. If I just show them a demo, it'll sell. All right? We see that a lot. Okay. Am I going too fast? Okay, uh, I figured not. This is a business school group, right? Okay, so another thing we see is entrepreneurs think that, well, they've got a board and some advisors who gave them four contacts, and that's going to equal four orders, right? And we call that a whistle funnel. Right? Every, every deal whistles through to an order, right? And the reality is that since you have the least credibility at an early stage, and companies are unwilling to do business, with unproven companies, large companies, or unwilling to do business with unproven small companies, right? you need the widest funnel, the most opportunities in your funnel at the earliest stage. Later, once you've proven that your solution works and you start to be referenceable, your ratio from the top to the bottom will improve. 200 might not be the right number for you. It could be higher or lower. But I guarantee you it's much bigger than you thought it might be. All right? And again, I would repeat, the challenge is to filter for acute pain in the people you're talking to as opposed to educating them on why they need some. Educating them on why they need some is a long process with a low close rate. <clears throat> okay, the other thing that's important is you need a managed sales process uh, to manage this because the numbers tend to get large and you want to be able to measure what you're doing. We tried this with 20 prospects, it didn't work. Okay, change. We tried this with 20 prospects. Okay, change. This next one we tried worked. Let's try to keep doing that for a while until we find out it doesn't work, right? So measurement and adaptation on a real-time basis is very, very important. Um, this is an eye chart. I'm not going to tell you about all of it. It merely says that to get uh, the number of orders that we want, which in this case is... Um, 17 customers in the year, right, with an average deal size of $100,000, we have to touch 4,800 prospects. That makes the point about the pipeline, okay? It's, it's a big number set. And you should have a model like this that looks at how many prospects you need to touch to get to the number of customers that you have as a goal in your first year. Okay. So let's talk about a sales process. Some of you have seen this in your prior lives, working with salespeople, where there's a suspect, there's a prospect. We do a first call. We do a demo. We do a second call. We do a demo. We do a third call. We educate them, right? And um, more calls, more demos. Been there, done this, right? Uh, the question is, is there a pilot or a trial? Do we get paid for it or not? We wait for the budget cycle. 
And by the tenth call, maybe we find out, do they care from a budget perspective, right? We see this a lot. Let me give you a little better process. All right, suspect prospect. First call is qualify and do a demo. Present your value proposition. Broker for access to the economic buyer. The economic buyer is that person who, in and of their own right, can make the yes and no decision. They take input from committees, but they have the power. Uh, if you want to read more about different uh, characteristics of different buyers, uh, Miller Hyman Strategic Selling uh, defines it fairly well. All right, by the second call, you meet the economic buyer. You qualify that person's pain, urgency, and budget. Now, what do you do if, in the first call, you don't get access to the economic buyer? Say, thank you very much. Walk down the street to the prospect who will give you access to the economic buyer. That is how you make your selling costs go down per unit of revenue dollar. Okay? And by the third call, you negotiate the process and you gain commitment to stop. Now... If you have a robust pop pipeline, a lot of prospects in your pipeline, it's easy to walk from deals that are not ideal, right? So often we see companies without a robust pipeline, and so we hang on to bad deals. That is a natural human uh, reaction, but it's very costly, okay? So the robust pipeline is really, really important for early stage companies. Let's talk about ideal customer characteristics. This is a set. Uh, the only one that matters to you is the last one, uh, willing and able to pay. You should have your own set of ideal customer characteristics. You should start homing in on that. I'm a big believer in one-page lists. They're very powerful for focus. They're very powerful for communicating to others on your team. Even if you have a small team, sometimes or often we'll see disagreement as to what's an ideal customer. So you need to work towards consensus on issues like this. All right. So what do you want from your early customers? You want time. You want them to review your specifications. You want them to look at your prototype, give you feedback, come to meetings, or you go meet them, right? You basically are looking for help. Now, you do ask for money because a free trial is not a customer. How many of you have customers that didn't pay you? Somebody in the room. Yeah, that's a free trial, sorry. Um, and, and there's value in that, but it's not a customer value. It's not validation of what you're trying to do. It's a, okay, we'll kick the tires kind of thing, all right? Maybe. Um, and so it's not about building a revenue growth plan, though. That's not the reason you're asking for money from your first customers. You're asking for money from your first customers because if you don't get money, you won't get the time. Make sense? Right? If I come to you and I say, I'm going to let you work on my software product uh, and I'm not going to charge you any money, and I need these three people's time to evaluate it, and Alan comes to you with his product, different application, and now you give that Alan fifty, hundred thousand dollars, needs the same three people's time. What's your decision? Goes to Alan's solution. All right. So that's what I mean. You need. You see. You need to uh, get the money to get the commitment. Okay. So here's a chart that speaks to customers who buy early and those who buy later. These are the ones who are subject to those transaction salespeople, right? And notice in each case the attribute is different. Early adopters do not expect your product or solution to be fully defined. They don't expect your value propositions to be verified. They're willing to go with value hallucination and put their data in so they can understand, right? And they also generally tend to be visionary as opposed to non-visionary in enterprises, all right? Uh, and they don't expect the sales tools to be perfect and the references to be perfect either. So that's another chart you need to think about as you're crafting your early sales processes. So what about approaching your first customer? Well, referral is a key from your board, your advisors, your investors, but brokered contacts are what we call those. They don't equal orders. The fact that you were given a contact or maybe even given a meeting doesn't mean you're going to get an order. It still needs analysis of requirements on the customer side. You have to make sure that the strategic decision makers are aligned with what you're trying to do. And then... You go in and you say, well, so how do you do it now? Well, we have spreadsheets and we have this database and it's all scattered and it takes a lot of time and we catch planes to do it. Well, what if you could have it all available to you, aggregated and assimilated in a fashion that it was usable real time by all people all around the world? Would you buy it? Oh, yeah, I'd do that. It'd save us a lot of money, improve our productivity. Cool. Are you willing to participate in the development? Because we have this core technology, but the product's fully developed. All right. If the answer is no, then what your action is, say thank you very much. Come back later when you have a fully developed solution. If the answer is yes, your next question is, will you contribute significant money? Now, significant money, in my view, is no less than half of what you expect to charge 
when the product is fully developed. So if your solution is a $100,000 solution, charging $5,000 is not significant money. It doesn't represent a significant enough commitment to the kind of thing you're trying to do. What about the ingredients of the deal? You guys aren't asking many questions. Come on. <laughs> okay, so you want their time, and this means specific people, right? You, what about limited right to use or unlimited right to use? How many of you are faced with that? Early customer says, we want a, uh, what's sometimes called a site license, right, to use throughout the corporation or unlimited right to use. I would suggest to you that the only time you want to give a truly unlimited right to use, all products, all time, all locations, all, all of your company, is when you're out of air. And what's air to a company? It's cash. So if you're out of cash and you have no other way to generate it, fine, go do one of those deals. But the decision that you are making is a trade-off between the cash now and the customer relationship later. Because when you do a truly unlimited right to use deal, and later on you're successful, you have a sales force, salesperson looks at their sales comp plan and says, I get paid on generating revenue or bookings or both. No bookings or revenue coming from that company. They got it all. Nobody calls on them. The relationship between the companies degrades and the competition gets the next opportunity at that company. All right? So the only time you want to think about doing that is when you're desperate for cash, in my, in my opinion. Um, and it, it matters a lot if you're successful and the rest of the time it doesn't matter. Okay, um, you do want cash. How about a press release? Should you negotiate the terms and the language of the press release in your deal? Absolutely. Why? Because your power is the greatest just before their executive signs the deal. That's when you have the most power to ask for stuff that you want. All right? After you've signed the deal, if you don't have the press release written into the deal, what happens is the PR department, the corporate PR department comes along, and what's their job? Their job is to prevent you from releasing anything in terms of information about what they're doing. And they have no ownership of the acute pain for the problem that you're solving. Right? And so if you wait for PR after the contract, you're uh, hurting yourself in terms of what you could get out of it. Okay, investor interviews. Some number of investor interviews per unit time with specific individuals in the organization. Likewise, <coughs> editor and analyst interviews should be negotiated. And then what about stock? I did a deal for a company a few years ago with uh, Hewlett Packard's um, uh, laser jet division in Boise at the time. It was a hosted uh, SaaS deal, about $200,000 a year. And um, so right towards the end, we were introduced to a department called Corporate Development, towards the end of the negotiations. And they said, so we're going to be your first customer. We're going to get 5% of your stock, right? Gulp. You know, what do we do? We really want Hewlett Packard. We really don't want to give up 5% of our stock. How do we deal with that, right? And the thing I would suggest to you here, if you get hit with something like that, is bring in somebody who is really skilled at negotiations with large companies and who can use the excuse of, I've got to go check. You, as the founder of your company, have a difficult time using the excuse when you're in a, in a, in a negotiation of, I've got to go check. Because you, you own the power to make the decisions, right? Whereas I, on many times, have had uh, titles that are not CEO where I didn't even need to use it, but I wanted to go regroup myself to figure out a new strategy, change the rules, how can I change the negotiation? I'd say, I've got to go check. It's not an ego deal. It's a negotiation strategy. So uh, that's another thing you want to think about. And then what about closing the deal? Well, dealing with e as equals is really, really important, right? Uh, are you going to do a win-win deal or a win-lose deal? Win-lose deal means we won the order, and everybody else in your company support Right? Engineering says, how are we going to do this? Okay? This doesn't fit with what we do. Right? And, and so uh, there's a lot of broken glass around deals like that. Win-win deal says we won the order and it fits right in with what, where we're going as a company, what we plan to supply and the way the solutions we're providing. Don't let the lawyers mess it up. I like to have a one-pager. It's the business deal that you negotiate. And then you hand it to the lawyers and say, give me this back in appropriate legal language. I'm, I'm not speaking badly about lawyers. I have a daughter who is a, a lawyer who is uh, in a high corporate position. Um, and beware of people like corporate development. And use your champions. Use the power. This is one of the reasons in enterprise deals you want to have champions with political power because there are going to be some obstacles you're going to want them to overcome for you as you're moving forward.
so there is a trade-off between the power of those in the line of business and those in other activities. And that's one reason why I am not a fan of starting low in the organization and it will automatically bubble up. And yet, some people have successful operations that way. But the chances of you becoming shelfware because your sponsors don't have enough power to see it through the organization is higher. So the next most important things, get them referenceable. And for this, in enterprises, normally services are key. I deal with a fair number of companies, particularly those from Israel, interestingly enough, who say, well, we're a product-only company. We're not going to do services. Yes, you are on the front end. You might later hand them off to a services organization, an SI. But early on, the SI is not interested in working with you. Why? You're not a proven provider of value for them. Right? And so you have to provide the services early on to make your solution successful to the customer. And would you like to have somebody else? Would you delegate to some other company your success with your early customers? I don't think so. Right? And then modify your value propositions as soon as possible. So that particular deal I told you about uh, with Hewlett Packard, we thought that our value proposition was about integrating a disparate supply chain. Right? And so three months after I did the deal, I went back to them and I said, so how are we doing on integrating your supply chain? And they giggled and they said, we haven't gone out to the supply chain with this. We love it, but it's about internal, ter internal control this year. And we'll get to this, this supply chain next year. So what do you think I said when I went to IBM? Huh? So you can't, smart people around a table can't come up with those subtleties. Right? You have to get that from customers. Okay, this is about references. Know which kind of references you want. The first kind is those who will say, we will buy it if they have it. They're only important for investors. The second kind say, we've evaluated it, we've bought it, but it's not yet an operational use. And the third kind, which are the best, take the longest to develop. All right? It's mission critical. We can't do without it. So when you're looking for references, know what stage you're at and the particular type of reference you're looking for. I'm going to move through this material. Why executives in the majority buy, it's about curing acute pain, and they are investors, right? They're going to give you some money now and expect to pay back soon. Understand the payback that they require. This is a value pyramid, right? And up at the top, it's a, sorry, down at the bottom, you are a vendor. You're a semiconductor manufacturer. You're a software utility tool, right? And it's price delivering quality. Oftentimes hard to differentiate yourself from others, right? The market is the largest there. Up at the top, you know more about the problem you're solving for your customer than your customer, right? And uh, so it's about domain expertise. As you move up to the top in software solutions, it often means you're going to go to a vertical right, orientation. Not always, but it often means that. And if you're going to be vertical as an early stage company, how many verticals can you do? One, thank you very much. All right? One and only one. Why? Being vertical means you have domain expertise in your company, in your employees, about the problem you're solving for that particular vertical. You cannot assemble that for more than one as an early stage. So the important thing is to know where you are, know where you want to be, and if you're not where you want to be, you will need to change the way you do things in terms of your configuration of product and services and technology, your orientation to solving the customer's problem. Down here, the responsibility for the solution and the responsibility for making it work is usually the customers. Up at the top, the responsibility for the selection of the solution and the responsibility for making it work is usually the suppliers. You will do things dramatically different depending upon where you are. This is also a reason why it's very, very difficult as an early stage company to offer something for $500 and something for $500,000. Just can't do it, right? Okay, uh, value proposition talks about revenue, cost, or control improvement. Uh, it answers these kinds of questions. Um, and simplicity is really, really key. Here's a, a solution where beforehand we're gathering information, we're aggregating it, and then we're able to take action. We bring in our solution, and now we have much more time available to take action. Call it selling or whatever you want. All right? I would urge you to create simple graphical depictions of what you do for your customers. To the extent that you can make them this simple, right, you will have a much easier time. The amount of time that goes into creating a very simple diagram of what you do for your customers is often huge. Don't be surprised if it takes 100 man hours. All right? It's very, very difficult.
right? And, and I can tell you stories about the development of these kinds of diagrams. Here's that value proposition matrix where we evaluate what we do. We find out how credible. We look at where we have customer facts and where we have assumptions. Be objectively critical of your facts versus your assumptions. Okay. This is an eye chart. It's our value pane matrix. Up at the top, we have title types, IT, finance, procurement, and so on. Down here, we have the problems that we solve. And what we look for is a combination of budget, ownership, and acute pain in one cell. Isn't selling across departments hard to do? Right? It's much harder to do when you don't have credibility as an early company. So you want to find those pockets of value proposition and title type where you have budget, ownership, and acute pain all in one cell, and then you focus there. Right? That's what you do. Okay. Uh, different titles care about different values, so, so the messages are derived from your value proposition. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I know I'm rushing, but I, I don't feel I'm, I want to move ahead. Uh, when it comes to ROI and payback, uh, understand the customer's costs in an enterprise solution, training, implementation, infrastructure, and then they start to see some benefit as your solution is adopted. And we used to talk about payback. What's much more important, I mean, about ROI, what's much more important is the time to cross through zero. And typically, for enterprise-type solution in today's economy, that's six months. For the energy market, that's about two years. So for different markets, it's different. Understand what your target market's criteria are for payback. How can you know your pricing if you haven't established your value and you haven't figured out the payback that your customer set wants. So it's really, really important to go to value and understand payback requirements to set pricing. Okay, so here is a perpetual license versus a subscription license from a customer view, right? And here is, sorry, and uh, so we have the license like I showed you and the subscription model comes in with lower cost and goes like this, right? From a supplier view, however, we get a license, sell it for a certain sum of cash, and then we get maintenance. And from a subscription model, it starts out with a lot less cash. The implications for investment are very, very important, and it goes through. And the ideal model is you'd sell a perpetual license to start and then transition them to a subscription model when you hit the crossover point, and some companies are doing that. Okay? Okay. Alan, you're on. Um, pull down and advance the slide. Push up to go back. Okay. All right, so I'm going to change gears pretty much completely. Uh, <laughs> um, so a lot of what Chuck has said so far is true about LinkedIn's own sales efforts. Uh, LinkedIn, as you know, is a, uh, our revenue model is basically built on a very large collection of professionals and interesting information about them and the ability to sell access for recruiting, for sales, et cetera, to other people via subscriptions, which will allow us essentially to monetize that asset which has been created by our users. So we have a fairly traditional sales cycle for the people who are actually selling those business products. But what I primarily want to talk about today is how did LinkedIn go about acquiring our customers, that 9 million users who are getting daily value out of LinkedIn, not all of them obviously, but... <laughs> Many are getting daily value out of using LinkedIn to support their own personal professional lives. Because I think in a lot of ways, there are lessons here for anybody who's trying to start up a consumer business sort of under the Web 2.0 structure. Um, I will warn you, though, that unlike talking about sales and talking about enterprise sales, which has a tremendous amount of study and understanding behind it, consumer Internet products in the Web 2.0 world is an emerging science at best. So... Hopefully, this will be useful and interesting information, um, but it's probably not all right. <laughs> so, so Web 1.0 versus 2.0, I want to talk about this very briefly. Um, Web 1.0, as you all know, oops, it's pretty sensitive. Um, people are familiar with the traditional Web 1.0 businesses, content sites, web directories, stores. Amazon, I mean, fame, there's a famous collection of them, obviously, from 1995 to 2001. In a lot of ways, they were very traditional companies with very traditional ideas of how you get to consumers. Web 2.0 has a very different way of approaching it. And when I think about Web 2.0, what I mainly think about is take the lessons which were learned from the first generation 
and apply it to the second generation. So when you look at Web 2.0, you look at social networks, photo sharing, blogging, the distribution is created by users and by search engine optimization. And the users are actually the pub, both the publishers and the consumers of the content which is being created. The reason Web 2.0 exists in the first place is that, oh man, getting ahead of myself. Um, basically, Web 1.0 is a very expensive way to do business. Content production, distribution, operations, all very heavy costs. However, under Web 2.0, we've managed to say, let's look back at the companies that made it work between 1995 and 2001 and take some of those ideas. So when you look at people who are allowing consumers to create the content, we were looking at people who are allowing the consumers to do distribution, whether you look at PayPal or eBay, where basically, either through viral spread or through other distribution forms, you can actually reduce your cost of customer acquisition to zero or near zero. And I'm happy to say for LinkedIn, our cost of customer acquisition is, we don't even have a good measure of it because we've really spent about $30,000 on marketing during the entire four years of we've been in business. Okay. Um, and, and the startup time and the cost of starting up is extraordinarily low for Web 2.0. It's just a much better way of making it happen. The key understanding, though, and the one which comes to how you pick those first customers is that in a Web 2.0 company, the users do most of the work. Okay? They distribute the product, they create the brand, they communicate it, and they build the asset that, ge that generates the revenue. Now, in LinkedIn's case, like I said, build, what you're building is a, a corpus of professionals who then become a valuable asset, not only for themselves, but also for other users who are also included in the group. The bottom line to making any Web 2.0 product work, and you can point to YouTube or you can point to, um, uh, <clears throat> you can point to some of the ones on Genie or Yelp or uh, Friendster, MySpace's participation. If you can drive participation, then you can build a valuable asset. So borrowing from Chuck's perhaps, if your cash flow is going to look like that, then somehow you need to be, be building value in the system. And as you raise that value, you're able essentially to monetize it. People monetize it in a lot of different ways. Um, oops, sorry. Um, but basically, you're, you're basing all of that either off a, a corpus of content which has been created, a collection of users who have become part of the system and are the resource that people want to pay to get access to. That about, just adding a little bit to it, that value is created in the, by this green curve of participation. If you can jumpstart that participation curve correctly, then basically you're going to be able to get your asset off to a really good start. So we've seen a tremendous number of, of, of companies go out there and be able to get, a good example I'm going to talk about a little bit here is Genie. Anybody familiar with Genie? G-E-I-N, G-E-N-I. It's a brand new startup. It's about two weeks old, or two weeks since their public launch anyway. And... They have, I'm going to guess, I'm going to say, 50 or 60,000 people who've already come and built family trees on the system. That distribution was entirely done through blogs. That's a great start for a company like that, to get people involved. Because that participation is going to be building the value of the asset, which every successive generation of users is going to build on. Let's see. So talking specifically about some of them, <coughs> um, Yelp. Never know Yelp. Okay. Um, it's, just, it's part social network, part reviewing system. Um, its distribution is primarily through people inviting, although that's actually secondary. It's primarily through SEOing and placement of the various reviews that are written about restaurants and whatever, and, and distribution through um, the actual through uh, through placement in Google or placement in Yahoo. So. I create the reviews, I get the reviews out in front of people, they come to Yelp and consume the content. Also, there's a social network aspect, you sort of get connected to friends and bring them in to share your reviews. Um, the value proposition that Yelp is creating, essentially, and these are just examples, is only valuable if you're able to create that mass of content. That mass of content is then what the next generation has to build on top of. Their revenue is based on people coming and reading those and then seeing, you'll see sponsored reviews, you'll see advertising along the side. So basically what they're doing is they're monetizing that asset, but they built a product which causes the, causes the asset to grow in the first place. 
Genie, there's not a lot to say about it. We haven't, we've all we've seen is good operation. Basically, at, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the way it works. You create, a, you create a, uh, a family tree for yourself, and you enter the email addresses of the people who are in your family tree. They get invited, and then they come add information. It's a very smooth, easy-to-use interface. It's a lot of fun. It also grows very quickly. That tree is going to become the source of value for every new customer who comes in the door, as well as for Genie as a business. Although, how they're going to monetize it, I don't know. Now, LinkedIn. LinkedIn has grown entirely organically from the invitations the eight founders sent in uh, since the summer of 2003 up to the nine million members we have today. It grows through invitations which go out to business colleagues. It's based off of your Outlook contacts or your webmail contacts or whatever. Basically, that is the asset. So it's not actually building content, although content is obviously part of it, profiles and so forth. But we wanted to create a large base of professionals as the asset, which we would then be able, in turn, to for those people to make use of, but also for, for, the, uh, for our customers. So how do users create value? This is where it gets a little experimental. Participation businesses rely on internal cycles of customer behavior. Okay? So if you're... Whoops. Am I jumping forward again? Okay. So basically... Yeah, I may have to do that. Although I can't gesture dramatically. <laughs> um, a very typical one, and one you're all familiar with from, uh, uh, from watching viral businesses grow over the years, is a very simple social network viral cycle. Person, in, you know, person who's in the system invites, somebody, somebody receives at some rate, they visit the site at some rate, they join at some rate, they in turn invite at some rate. Inside all of these businesses are cycles which work like this. Little engines which drive growth or drive content creation. Ideally, you would be able to identify those things as you're creating your business and say, well, this is the engine that we actually want to drive. If you can't identify them, you probably have a problem. You can't distribute it unless you've got an engine which allows you to move forward. Um, so, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the important thing is that as you're adding generations as you go forward, each one relies on the value which was created before them, it relies on a critical mass of value. So when you look at the way LinkedIn grew, basically, we got our initial group of early adopters who came in and did stuff. And I'm going to talk about that specifically in a minute. When those people had reached a certain density in a particular area, essentially the next group, the next slightly harder to reach group, was able to see value in what they saw on the website. Until that point, that group would never have become part of LinkedIn. Because basically, they looked at it and said, well, there's nobody here. What do you do with it? I can't even search for anybody. I can't find anybody I know, or I can't find anybody I need. Every generation, though, has added extra value to that. And the next generation comes in and says, oh, look, now I can do something with it. Now I understand the value. And it's been interesting for us to watch as we go along. I see lots of people saying, oh, now I get it. Even though they joined three years ago, they still didn't know what the hell was going on. Now they come back and they say, wow, there's millions of people here and half the people I went to school with are here. So now I can get connected to them. Or I didn't know you could do a reference search on LinkedIn. That's amazing. Because now there's actual value in creating. And actually, now there's actual value created. Engines at LinkedIn. I'm going to cover this briefly. What kind of engines actually drove the, drove, the, drove the construction of LinkedIn and the asset that we've got? Um, the value propositions we put in front of people are professional identity, don't lose touch, and use your network to get stuff done. Okay? Professional identity come, it expresses itself as profiles. When somebody produces a profile, not only are they producing information which allows them to get connected more easily, allows them to establish their professional network, but also makes them part of the search that everybody else does. By not losing touch, by keeping in touch with people who I don't want to lose track of, I create connections, and those connections, not only do they spread the service, but they also create a denser network which increases anybody else's visibility around me. So essentially every action has a second action built into it, which says, here's how it's going to add value to the overall asset. And obviously, use your network, whether it's search or services or new answers project or whatever, every single one of those, in turn, activates all the people in the system. So they come back and take greater action. If there's something we discovered as we went along, it's that 
actions taken in the system cause reactions among the people who they affect, and then those people come back and act. Quick note about this, there are, there are two, at least two types of value to be created. One type is content value, the other is sort of people or, core, uh, or uh, uh, um, directory value. For companies like Yelp and Dig, um, you need to build some value in your, you need to build some value in the corpus and the actual content which is being created before you actually consider distribution. Because that corpus is actually the thing which does the distribution, as I said earlier. <coughs> um, with LinkedIn or any social network, I think what you're looking for more is distribution first. Because in other words, distribution is the source of the value. If you have broad distribution, you have broad value. And then that, in, that turns around and becomes the valuable resource. They're, they're different but important because it does, in the end, affect what customers you choose to go out and, 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 and bring in on day one, depending on what your real goal so is. One of the things we see that group... That first customer participation, that bump of participation you get at the beginning, is absolutely key to making, making a successful, fast start. One of the things which is almost always true, especially about new web companies that are being created today, is that they almost always need to have a fast start. If they don't get a fast start, then they're going to run out of money before they're able to prove their value proposition. So <clears throat> what will that first, gener first generation do? It's got to somehow start the engines that you understand are going to be part of your, system, part of your, uh, part of your product. They've either got to build that critical mass of initial value by writing reviews on Yelp, or they've got to establish that critical mass of people by distributing, and that's the way LinkedIn did it. In the beginning of LinkedIn, we had very, one could argue we still have rudimentary search features, but at the beginning we had very rudimentary search features, and the reason was there was no point. It's like... Yes, you need a little bit of information so you could browse and see things, but the key part was distribution. And the distribution came based on personal relationships, not based on the content or the quality of the thing you see when you get there. And it's not that we didn't think there was quality, it's that we knew we couldn't prove it until there was a very large number of people there. When, we, when LinkedIn went out to acquire our first customers, we had in mind a very specific set of people who we wanted to transmit our brand. We wanted to transmit essentially a proper way of using the system. We wanted to represent the level of seniority and eliteness, that we, eliteness if that's a word, that we wanted to have in the system. Okay? So we handpicked those people. And those first, first eight people who did the inviting, we focused on that group. But we also knew that every single product has an early adopter market, whether you want it to or not. Okay? That includes people who are very interested in professional networking. Very interested in meeting as many people as possible. Very interested in sort of online professional communities. We knew those people existed as well. So our job, when we first started LinkedIn, was build a product which is designed for the elite group who we want to kick off our product with. In other words, vice presidents, influential people, venture capitalists, all the people who were going to drive that initial growth that mattered so much to us and that initial brand that mattered so much to us but design a product which works for everybody else, but blocks the negative behaviors that those people might bring with them. Okay? So if anybody remembers, there was no direct contact available in LinkedIn when we started. The reason was is that we were counting on every individual to act as a filter for a bad action. So basically, I had to go through you, because you and I are connected, and I wanted to get to him. Well, if I'm a bad actor, you can stop me. Okay? Once we got to the point where LinkedIn had established its brand and established its use, we were able to say, okay, now, by putting other mechanisms in place, we're able to actually allow direct contact. Because we've established our brand, we've established how people use the system. So when we acquired, to answer your question, those people were acquired because they heard about us, they read about us in a blog, um, they saw some press about us, whatever it is. They came into the system invited like crazy, tried to tear up the place, not because, they, not because they were bad or evil, but because that's how they wanted to use the product. But the product was ready for them when they got there. So on day one, we launched with the ability to join cold, as we say. Talking about that, that initial audience, the people who are going to come use the system whether you want them to or not, this in the consumer internet world is a graph that everybody understands because basically you've got sort of 1% of people who do 80% of the work, 
90% of people who do the remaining 20%, and then everybody else hangs out. And it does things occasionally. Okay? The, people you got, the people you need to make sure you design for are the people who are the top two components of this pyramid. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. There's a question of overlap. How much does the desired audience that you want to go out to overlap with that early, that early adopter audience? Because if you look at a company, if you look at a, if you look at, say, YouTube, or you look at um, Genie even, or MySpace, there's a high level of overlap between these two groups. If you look at something like LinkedIn, like LinkedIn, there's less overlap. In other words, there really are people out there who you don't want to be part of that first audience. I'm sure this is all self-evident, right? Pleasure. Oh, okay. So, um, and you guys will get all this. So, sorry, I'm just trying to get it all done before we go. And I'll come back to your question in a minute. Um, uh, so, value proposition. I mean, key things, value proposition for Web 2.0 companies, and this is a problem that LinkedIn had, has, still has, simplicity, because users need to be able to convey that value proposition. Generally speaking, a value proposition which is mapped to pleasure and not to pain is going to be much more successful. Now, that's generally true in consumer brands. But it's especially true here because, for the most part, I'm, most, I'm, I'm more likely to participate if I'm doing something which is fun than if I'm doing something which is necessary. Okay? And finally, surprise and delight. If I find something which is surprising or interesting, and you guys, if you haven't looked at Genie, you should look at Genie. Genie is a great example of surprise and delight and simple to use interface and so forth. It's, I mean, it's really excellent. Um, and basically, that's something I want to share with other people just because it's so cool. And that makes a big difference. I wanted to uh, raise the, uh, the, the, the possibility of a hybrid model. And one of the things that I'm experiencing now is uh, some early stage companies are looking at how they would go to market by first attracting individual users or focusing on an enterprise application and then coming back to the other. And what I'm seeing investors vote for is attract the individual users first Early revenue being advertising and develop enterprise models later. And so it is applying many of the things that you talked about in Web 2.0 to a potential enterprise model where you're getting sort of professional participation first. And um, that's a little bit of a surprise, but I want to say that that's certainly an opportunity. Are there examples of, just to follow up that point, one, just one second. There are, there are examples out there, like Salesforce.com, if people are familiar right. with Salesforce, right. is doing a good job of... of essentially doing enterprise sales on an individual basis, so they're very interesting to look at. Um, disclaimer, partner. Thank you very much for your time and attention.